Okay. Late start. Joe Biden kept a campaign promise. He's tackling student debt. He really is, despite the Supreme Court ruling against him, despite Republicans fighting him every step of the way. Joe Biden has re- has relieved at least a hundred billion, if not more, in student loan debt, and that is a record he can run on. More on that a little later on in the show. But first, this is the mop-up for November 29th, 2023. I'm David Feldman. Thank you for finding me. Late start. Don't ask. I'm sure you could figure out why. Please like this episode so I remain in your feed and make sure to subscribe to my newsletter as well as this channel. This program is an audio podcast And you can download it on iTunes or wherever you listen to mediocre podcasts like mine. Uh, We also post an audio podcast of the show on YouTube as well. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter's memorial was yesterday at the Glen Memorial United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. The service was attended by all the living First Ladies, including Melania Trump. During the service, Melania said she wished Donald was there and then pointed to the coffin. Jimmy Carter and Donald Trump have a relationship dating back to the 1980s. Jimmy built houses for the homeless and Trump created them. Meanwhile, Melania is now coming under criticism for wearing light gray instead of black like the other first ladies did. But considering what Melania Trump did, did to earn money before she married Donald, we should just be grateful she wore clothing. According to a new book, Kevin McCarthy told the Republican caucus that he flew down to Mar-a-Lago only weeks after January 6th to meet with Donald Trump, only because he was told Trump wasn't eating. Trump wasn't depressed. He stopped eating because he accidentally wandered through the Mar-a-Lago kitchen and saw how the food is prepared. There is now talk that Kevin McCarthy is depressed and that he too is not eating. And he finds life as just a backbencher, just a member of the House of Representatives with absolutely no power. He finds it unbearable. Many say it will come as no surprise when he announces sometime in January that he's quitting before the 2024 elections. We may see, I am hearing, some are saying that Kevin McCarthy will be out of the House of Representatives before March. And that creates an empty seat for Republicans, one they need, which brings us to George Santos. Now, on yesterday's show, I said there was no way Republicans would vote to remove George Santos. Remember, you need a two-thirds majority to expel a member of Congress. 182 Republicans voted not to expel him back on November 1st, when that last motion was taken to the floor. On Tuesday, Democrats Dan Goldman and Robert Garcia introduced motions to force a vote on Santos by tomorrow. But there's no way any of those 182 Republicans would go along with a Democratic proposal to remove George Santos. But New York Republican Anthony Desposito followed up on Tuesday with his own motion to get rid of Santos, which members of his Republican caucus are more likely to favor, except why? Why would they give up a seat that the latest polls indicate would be turned over to a Democrat after the special election. According to New York state law, the governor of New York has to announce a special election immediately after George Santos is voted out, and that new member would have to be seated within fewer than 90 days, and that new member would most likely be a Democrat. It makes absolutely no sense for Republicans to nibble away at their already razor-thin majority over something as trivial as ethics. You're going to let ethics get in the way of your majority? 
Congressman Dan Goldman, who I just talked about, he's the one who introduced a motion to expel Santos. Dan Goldman is a Jewish Democrat who joined forces with Greg Landsman, a Jewish Democrat from Ohio. The two of them introduced a resolution condemning Republican Congressman Ryan Zinke's new bill introduced earlier this month that would expel visiting Palestinians from the United States. Co-sponsored by 10 other Republicans, this bill would revoke visas, deny refugee status or political asylum to any Palestinians holding a passport from the Palestinian Authority. Axios reports this morning the resolution condemning this bill, Dan Goldman's uh, and Lonsman's uh, resolution condemning this bill is unusual. Very rarely will members of Congress introduce a motion to rebuke another proposed piece of legislation. Normally, House members simply vote against a bill they don't approve of, and they leave it at that. But Ryan Zinke's bill is so, is an abomination, the idea of expelling Palestinians from the United States. A partial government shutdown is only 51 days away unless the House and the Senate can get the 2024 budget approved, a budget that by law was supposed to have been passed back on October 1st. Right now, as you all know, the government is being kept open by a continuing resolution that pretty much is an extension of the 2023 budget because it keeps spending levels exactly the same, which is not what Republicans want. They, they feel they won the midterms and they don't want to live under Nancy Pelosi's budget. People like Mike Johnson, the new speaker, have made it clear they want 30 percent cuts across the board. But that's never going to happen. Republican Senator John Cornyn of Texas said yesterday that he thinks there will be no 2024 budget ever and that we're looking at a year long continuing resolution. This has happened before during the Obama administration. And what would that mean? It means that there would be possibly a 1% cut in spending across the board. Why is that? Well, there was that deal Joe Biden struck with then Speaker Kevin McCarthy back in June to avoid a government shutdown by raising the debt ceiling. Do you remember the debt ceiling crisis back in June? If you remember, the government was running out of cash and Congress had to agree to raise the debt ceiling in order for Janet Yellen, our Treasury Secretary, to borrow more money. One of the provisions of the deal that Biden and the Democrats agreed to is if there's no budget for 2024 by January 1st of 2024, an automatic 1% across the board spending cut would then take effect. Now, there is some debate as to when exactly that 1% cut would be triggered. Democrats are now saying the cuts wouldn't go into effect until April 30th. Republicans like Chip Roy of Texas say no, January 1st, 1% across the board cuts. Now, one of the reasons we may not get a budget passed is because back in June, when Biden and McCarthy negotiated that debt ceiling agreement, both parties agreed to cap discretionary funding for 2024 at roughly $1.6 trillion. But there was some wiggle room. And right now, both the Democrats and the Republicans haven't figured out just how much wiggle room there actually is. So both sides first have to settle on what the top line is. Will it be $1.6 trillion? 1.5, 1.7, until Republicans and Democrats can agree on how much they're willing to spend in total, there's no way they can pass meaningful appropriations bills for the 2024 budget because they have no idea how much they have to spend. So it's looking like Senator John Cornyn may be right that we, we may end up not having a 2024 budget, just a 
a year-long continuing resolution, and of course, government shutdowns. Seven appropriations bills have cleared the House, but they have yet to clear the Senate. Then they have to go into conference committees and then vote it on again. So it's starting to look like we're heading into the Iowa caucuses and election season with looming government shutdowns. The Republicans do not want abortion to be the issue. The budget, they are going to make the budget the campaign issue in 2024. And I don't think we have a 2024 budget. I think we're going to also be looking at a lot of brinksmanship, political posturing, and possibly shutdowns. On yesterday's show, I told you about Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act expiring on January 1st. Section 702 was passed immediately after September 11th, 11th, so that the FBI and other intelligence agencies could, without a warrant, intercept phone calls, emails, and spy on foreign nationals who travel to America, who travel back and forth from their home countries to America. For example, Mohammed Atta, he was a foreign national. He visited the United States. And the thinking is that if the FBI had the legal tools back then to tap his phone, read his emails, they could have stopped him from flying a plane into the World Trade Center. But the ACLU, as well as libertarians like Senator Rand Paul, see Section 702 as government overreach. They say it has been used to spy on American citizens. President Biden, as well as current and former intelligence chiefs, are urging Congress to renew 702 before it expires on January 1st. Senator Mark Warner is the chairman of the Intelligence Committee in the Senate. He introduced a bipartisan bill Tuesday that would revise 702, but still allow our government to spy on foreign nationals without a warrant. And if those foreign nationals are talking to American citizens, that means the government is spying on American citizens without a warrant. Warner's bill would prevent the FBI from going through the surveillance material in order to find evidence of ordinary American citizens committing ordinary crimes. But the ACLU says this doesn't go far enough. So that's Senator Warner's bill in the Senate. Meanwhile, Punchbowl reports that the odious chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, the disgusting Jim Jordan, he, too, is no fan of Section 702, and he is marking up a separate bill that would revise 702 with more protections for citizens. But there's no way that bill will ever move out of the House and up to the Senate before January 1st, when 702 expires. So, like our budget, we're expecting a temporary extension of Section 702, a temporary extension. That would most likely fly through both houses of Congress and get signed by President Biden before the new year. But the question is, how long would this extension last? And would it be extended as is? Or will there be minor changes? As I've always said, fascism has its charms. You just have one guy making all, all the decisions. James Comer of Kentucky, the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, one of the three committees investigating a potential impeachment of Joe Biden, he said that Hunter Biden will have to testify behind closed doors. Hunter Biden, the president's son, has been subpoenaed to appear before the committee on December 13th and said he would obey the subpoena, but wants to testify publicly so that Americans won't have to rely on leaks or Republicans to find out what he actually said. Hunter's attorney, Abby Lowell, in a letter to the committee, said Chairman Comer intentionally leaked information from previous witnesses who testified about Hunter Biden. He wrote to the chairman, quote, we have seen you use closed door sessions to manipulate, even distort the facts and misinform the public. We therefore propose opening the door. Jamie, Rank 
Jamie Raskin is the ranking member of the Oversight Committee. That means it's uh, in the House. So the chairman is a Republican because Republicans control the House. If Democrats control the House, Jamie Raskin would be the chairman. That makes him the ranking member of the House Oversight Committee. And he accused Republicans of cowardice for not allowing Hunter Biden to testify in public. He said if Hunter did so on TV, the American people would finally learn that Republicans have zero evidence against the Biden family. In all fairness, the January 6th committee subpoenaed uh, Rudy Giuliani and Rudy Giuliani wanted uh, an open door testimony and they refused. There, there is some value to closed door depositions. Well, as I said at the top of the show, Joe Biden has kept part of his promise. Considering what he's up against, he's done a pretty good job when it comes to relieving student loan debt. 800,000 Americans whose student debt was forgiven by the Biden administration should have received emails yesterday asking them to contact their member of Congress to urge passage of more student loan relief. When Biden first took office, it was understood that as president, he could forgive most student loans through an executive order. He tried, but the Supreme Court back in June said it was unconstitutional. Biden has since been working with the Department of Education to find legal workarounds And before that, even before the Supreme Court ruled against him, he has been able to forgive some student loans in the since he's been in office. uh, He's forgiven uh, student loans for three point six million Americans. And that's a grand total of one hundred and twenty seven billion dollars. That's pretty remarkable, considering what he's up against. Now, student loan debt is close to $1.8 trillion, and the COVID-era moratorium on paying it uh, back, the moratorium on paying it back, ended on October 1st. 92% of all student loan debt, that's roughly $1.6 trillion, is owed to the Department of Education. Speaking of young people in debt, Kyle Rittenhouse, remember him? He shot to death two Black Lives Matter protesters, injured one, and then was found innocent on account of he's white. Well, he's broke. And the guy didn't even borrow money to go to college. And he's still broke. His new book, Acquitted, that's the name of his book, uh, which is truth in advertising. He was acquitted. He's not innocent, But he was acquitted, and that's the name of his book, Not Selling Well. Hard to believe. You would think his fans uh, are also fans of books, and they would just buy, couldn't wait to read, couldn't wait to learn how to read uh, to find out what he had to say. So his book isn't selling well. Let me just shed a tear here for that. So sad. Well, Mark Richards, Kyle Rittenhouse's attorney, says Kyle has lost all his money since he was acquitted. Gee, I wonder who took all his money. Let me think. Who could have taken? Oh, oh yeah, Mark Richards, his attorney. That's who took all his money. And now Kyle is being sued in civil court for wrongful death by the families of his two victims. Meanwhile, The 20-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse has filed an application with the Texas Secretary of State to establish the Kyle Rittenhouse Foundation, where people can donate and then he can continue his work championing the right to bear arms. Rittenhouse was very active this year in Texas politics, making the rounds lobbying lawmakers in Texas not to raise the age to 21 in order to purchase an assault weapon. Yeah, that's the guy you want speaking up for teenagers. That's the guy you want saying, yeah, teenagers should be allowed to buy assault weapons. 
the kid who panicked and killed two people with one when he was 17, he's the one who should be speaking up for assault rifles for teenagers. Well, he's broke. Also broke, Rudy Giuliani, who is not only having trouble paying back his lawyers, now it looks like he can't pay back his accountants. Rudy is being sued for $25,000 by the accountants who helped him with his last divorce, saying he's been in arrears for nearly five years. Get in line. Get in line. Donald Trump is holding another fundraiser in December at the Bedminster Golf Course for him. He did one uh, last summer. Uh, it was $100,000 a plate. And from that fundraiser, Rudy was able to pay, I think, $14,000 to his lawyers. Where'd all the money go? Donald did a big fundraiser at the country club, and Rudy only ends up with $14,000 while he's doing another fundraiser for Rudy at the Bedminster Country Club next month. Well, there's even worse news for Rudy. Remember, as bad as you think you have it, <laughs> it'll never be as bad as Rudy Giuliani. Uh, there are now reports that the Fulton County District Attorney is not interested in making a plea deal with him. In other words, she wants to lock him up, which is good because he probably needs a place to sleep. The feeling is among the... Uh, Fulton County District Attorneys, is there's nothing he has to offer, especially since he's the reason for the RICO trial. He was one of the masterminds uh, behind this entire criminal enterprise. The purpose of the RICO trial down in Georgia was to get the low-hanging fruit to flip in order to incriminate three people, Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and Mark Meadows. So the same applies to Trump's former White House chief of staff, Mark Meadows. The Fulton County District Attorney is not interested in offering him a plea deal either. This is what we're hearing. Meadows, by all accounts, has flipped in the federal January 6th trial against Donald Trump. The Fulton County District Attorney, however, not interested in making a deal with Mark Meadows. Meadows reportedly spoke with special counsel Jack Smith three times this year and testified at least once under oath before a grand jury. And according to reporting done by ABC News back in October, Meadows, Trump's former chief of staff, his last chief of staff, told the grand jury that Trump was dishonest when he went before the American people on election night and said there was massive voter fraud. Meadows has told Jack Smith and the grand jury in Washington, D.C., there was absolutely no evidence when Donald Trump made that statement. He said Trump invented it. Meadows also reportedly testified that in the lead up to January 6, he never once came across a single shred of evidence suggesting voter fraud. And he told Donald Trump that repeatedly. Meadows reportedly told the grand jury that he agreed with the Department of Homeland Security's assessment that the 2020 presidential election was the most secure in recent memory. Meadows told the grand jury that he misled the public when he wrote in his book that the 2020 presidential election was rigged against Donald Trump and that there was rampant voter fraud. This is why the publisher of the book is now suing Meadows to get their money back. Meadows has been given immunity by the special counsel to assist in the prosecution of Donald Trump in the Washington, D.C. trial, but the Fulton County District Attorney is offering him nothing, nothing. Trump's vice president, Mike Pence, has also told the special counsel, Jack Smith, that he repeatedly urged Donald Trump to accept defeat in the run-up to January 6th, but Trump wasn't interested in anything Pence had to say. According to ABC News, Pence 
told Jack Smith, special counsel, that Trump wouldn't listen to anyone other than the outside attorneys he brought in who Pence described as, quote unquote, cranks. Pence accused these attorneys of espousing un-American legal theories. Pence said the pressure on him grew so intense that he seriously considered not showing up on January 6th to certify the election. Pence told the special counsel he considered Trump a friend and out of loyalty, he couldn't bring himself to be the individual who certified the election for Joe Biden. He said he agreed to show up only after his son, a Marine, reminded him that he swore an oath to uphold the Constitution. Rupert Murdoch is no longer running News Corps or Fox News, but he was deposed yesterday and he's being deposed today in voting machine company Smartomatic's $2.7 billion defamation lawsuit. Like the Dominion voting machine lawsuit settled earlier this year for close to three quarters of a billion dollars, Fox News is being sued for reporting that Smartmatic voting machines were used to throw the 2020 presidential election in Joe Biden's favor. During his testimony in the Dominion case earlier this year, Rupert Murdoch said he thought the 2020 election was fair, saw no evidence of fraud, and was concerned about Fox News's coverage of the voter fraud claims. Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, two of Trump's attorneys, who made repeated appearances on Fox News charging voter fraud, are also being sued by Smartmatic. Is there anybody not suing Rudy Giuliani? New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu said he will endorse a Republican candidate for president sometime before the New Hampshire primary. He says it's down to three people, Nikki Haley, Chris Christie, <clears throat> or Ron DeSantis. When asked about Vivek Ramaswamy, Sununu called him a joke and then added he will not be endorsing Donald Trump. Governor Sununu said even though Trump is leading in the polls in New Hampshire, it's not inconceivable that Trump could end up losing the New Hampshire primary. He said that New Hampshire law, we talked about this, New Hampshire law allows voters who are independents, who are not registered Democrats, not registered Republicans, you're allowed to vote in the Republican primary if you're not registered as a Democrat. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said that means he's expecting at least 100,000 unregistered Republicans to vote in the New Hampshire primary. And he says it's unlikely any of them will be voting for Trump. He said the polls are of likely Republican voters. They don't include the 100,000 unregistered Republicans who might tilt the election away from Donald Trump. Sununu is not a fan of Donald Trump. He said he isn't voting for Trump in the primary, but he said if Trump is nominated, then he will vote for him. He will vote for Trump over Joe Biden. Americans for Prosperity Action, it's a super PAC funded by billionaire Charles Koch's political machine, They've come out in favor of Nikki Haley. The endorsement from Charles Koch is expected to bring in millions and millions of dark money to the Nikki Haley campaign. And that's bad news for Ron DeSantis. He was expecting Koch to get behind him. Uh, he received a considerable amount of money uh, from Koch in uh, his 2022 reelection bid for governor of Florida. While Nikki Haley performs poorly against Trump in the primaries, most polling shows her defeating Joe Biden in the general election by a much larger margin than Trump or DeSantis. Of course, those polls mean nothing, but it does influence, those polls influence who people like Charles Koch give their money to because... Uh, Haley, 
beat, like in Michigan, in the key states, Haley beats Biden by as much as like nine, 10 points. That's who you're going to give your money to if you're a Republican pig. Right now, the Democrats control the Senate while the Republicans control the House. It is now believed that, short of a red wave, and they're, if you look at the polling, it suggests that, I hate to say this, Nikki Haley, these mean nothing, but she, she could bring about a red wave. But short of a red wave, Democrats have a pretty good chance of taking the House back. That's because more and more Americans are turned off by the internal squabbling of the Republican caucus. And more importantly, thanks to court-ordered redistricting, a lot of congressional maps are being redrawn in a way that favor the Democrats. But what about the Senate? Joe Manchin, the Democratic senator from West Virginia, announced he's not running for re-election. And that means his seat will most definitely turn red. It will be won by the current Republican governor of West Virginia, Jim Justice, who is running for that seat. So currently, the Republicans have 49 senators. Democrats have 48. But there are three independents, Bernie Sanders of Vermont, Angus King of Maine, and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, there three of them are independents, but they caucus with the Democrats. So that gives Democrats 51 to the Republicans 49. That's where it stands right now. When J next year Jim Justice replaces Joe Manchin, then we have a tied Senate 50 50. And that's OK since the vice president is a Democrat and she breaks the ties. But that's not how it's going to shake out. The Hill uh, has come up with a list of the five Democratic Senate seats in 2024 that are in danger of going red. They are. This is just uh, this is useful. Joe Manchin of West Virginia. That's gone. That, that's a lost cause. That goes red. Then there's John Tester of Montana, and Montana is a deep, deep, deep red state, so that makes him incredibly vulnerable. And off the top of my head, I think of the five, it's West Virginia and Montana that are the ones most likely to turn red. West Virginia is definitely red. Then there's Democrat Sherrod Brown of Ohio. Now, Ohio, as we know, is no longer a swing state when it comes to presidential elections. It's deep red. But Sherrod Brown is an incumbent who is popular with the working class. Last year, Republican J.D. Vance was elected to the Senate from Ohio, beating Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan by seven percentage points. Ryan was a really good candidate, and he lost. Now, if Nikki Haley is the nominee and the polling stays constant, we, we could expect a red wave, at least in Ohio. Uh, but if Trump's on the ballot, I think Sherrod Brown has a pretty good shot. And this is what's so scary as horrible as Trump is, and as terrifying as he is, when you look at the internals, Biden has a much better chance right now against Trump than he does against Nikki Haley. So who do you root for if you want, if you're me and you want Joe Biden reelected? I think you have to root for Trump. But back in 2016, Democrats wanted Trump to get the nomination. They thought he'd be the easiest one to beat. But that's what the polls are signaling once again. Right now, the polls are si signaling if you're a Democrat, you want Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee. If you look at Haley in the general, she demolishes Joe Biden. And 
it's a wave election right now. And again, these polls mean nothing unless you're the Koch brothers, unless you're Charles Koch. You look at these polls and you say, I'm giving all my money to Nikki Haley and not DeSantis. That's why these polls are important. They're, they're not a good leading indicator of the final results of an election, but they help candidates and uh, donors tack with the wind. Uh, the other thing is Nikki Haley's a fraud, and right now she hasn't been scrutinized by the American people or the press. But then again, Trump, George W. Bush, and especially Ronald Reagan were frauds. And uh, and then there's Bob Casey of Pennsylvania. Again, unless it's a red wave, I'm not sure how Biden or Kate. Uh, Casey loses Pennsylvania. I just don't see uh, Republicans winning in Pennsylvania. Last year, two Democrats, John Fetterman, got elected to the Senate, and Josh Shapiro was elected governor, two solid wins, Democrats. So I, I think it still looks good for the Democrats in Pennsylvania. And I also think it looks good for the Democrats in Arizona. You've got Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. She was a Democrat. Then this year she became an independent. And now we're not even certain she's running for re-election, especially since her donations have dried up. And she's running third in the latest polls behind election denier Carrie Lake. Remember her? She ran for governor on the platform of election fraud. Vote for me. I believe in election fraud. She lost. Uh, she comes in second. And then Congressman Ruben Gallego, the Democrat, comes in first. And Gallego is bringing in a lot of money. A lot. Hard to see Ruben Gallego losing to Carrie Lake. So those are the five seats to keep an eye on as we head into the 2024 election cycle. Tomorrow I'll go over... The possible pickups. Could Ted Cruz, for example, lose in Texas? You know, Beto O'Rourke, it was much closer in 2008. I think Beto only lost by 200,000 votes in Texas. Ted Cruz may be vulnerable. Pope Francis has had enough with Cardinal Raymond Burke, a conservative American cardinal who has been highly critical of the pontiff, highly critical because the pontiff has embraced the LGBTQ community and immigrants. There are reports now that Cardinal Burke was evicted by the Pope from his Vatican City apartment and stripped of his salary. Boy, the Pope is a tough landlord. Remind me not to rent an apartment from the Pope Burke is the second conservative to be disciplined by the Pope this month. The Bishop of Tyler, Texas, Joseph Strickland, was ordered to removed after the Pope accused him of mismanaging his di diocese. diocese. Uh, Strickland, like Burke, has been highly critical of Pope Francis's liberal policies. Cardinal Burke criticized the Pope's efforts to encourage divorced couples to join the church. He's also critical of the Pope's more recent overtures to the LGBTQ plus community. Burke, Cardinal Burke, is a huge supporter of Donald Trump, as well as several other European political leaders who oppose open borders. In 2004, Cardinal Burke famously denied communion to then presidential candidate John Kerry because of his views on abortion. Uh, Burke, Cardinal Burke, uh, has also alienated the Pope by his flamboyant dress. I'm not making this up. Vatican officials, according to the New York Times, ordered Cardinal Burke to tone it down when he began showing up wearing long flowing robes, velvet gloves, and extravagant showy jeweled ornaments. Hey, first rule of show business, never dress better than your boss. Never outshine 
the boss. So that's two conservative Republicans, essentially the Republicans who Pope Francis has disciplined. There is a problem, according to the Pope, with Catholics who vote Republican. The Pope has said that. Last August, during a visit to Portugal, the Pope warned that too many Catholics in the United States were becoming reactionary in both their politics and how they view the Catholic Church. The Pope called reactionary politics backward. Well, they are. You're looking, that is by definition what reactionary is. He said it shows, if you're reactionary, it shows that you're unwilling to evolve. He said these Republican Catholics are stuck in their ideologies and added that the real fruit to be found in the church is through forward thinking and welcoming change. Welcoming change. Well, we tried something new because of technical difficulties. A uh, Either a much later start or a much earlier one. Uh, let me know uh, what you think in the comments sections. This is a... Uh, an interesting time to do the show. I'm used to doing it at midnight, three in the morning, whatever. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Please like this episode so I remain in your feed. Please subscribe to my newsletter, subscribe to my channel, share this episode with your friends. Thank you all. I'm going to go watch Sam Cedar. Thank you to everybody in the chat room. Gonna go watch the majority report.